Five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay, good afternoon, all, and uh, welcome to this edition of Cultural Perspectives, um, the show where we try to um, analyze and, and different aspects of cultural issues um, from from different vantage points. Um, tonight, we're, we're looking at an issue that's going on uh, in Raleigh with the the uh, Shaw University transformation or the attempt of, of, of such um, mm -hmm. and how this how this is is relative to what's going on in other parts of North Carolina um, and how this impacts the, the the whole preservation of culture um, you know we're looking at the eradication of a cultural issue um, a cultural uh, a symbol in the midst of a gentrification or via gentrification in the yeah. in the um, Raleigh network in the Raleigh uh, community, so uh, a an institution Shaw University that's been around for for decades and it's um, very essential to what we're doing in terms of uh, pr trying to preserve our culture and the the educational institutions that represent such. So um, that's one of the discussions. Where I'm, uh, I've invited participants from the Wake County Housing Justice Coalition, which is which are on the front lines of the, the addressing this issue and trying to preserve the, the 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 culture in terms of what's going on at the at Shaw, and um, we're pleased to have uh, Mr. Wa with us this evening um, to give us some insight as to what's going on and. So we can have a discussion around what 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 your organization thinks is happening, um, and how we can how we can be supportive, or what what we need to do in terms of addressing this issue. We also have the infamous the infamous Coach Garrison, who is who is um, <laughs> guiding us along this path this evening. Um, thanks for being here, Coach. And I think we have uh, Jazzy Joy on the on the line and on um, on on the call, but she's not on it, not the video. I think she's just on on the line. So thanks everyone for participating, and we can get started. Well, let me ask you: What are some of the issues that are that are are germane to this this situation that have, have, that we're looking at trying to prevent or stop or from your perspective yeah um, thanks for the invitation thomas um most of what i know and understand about the issue with this zoning case surrounding shaw university in raleigh comes from uh, comes from a conversation that i've had with keisha monk who is part of the group called save our shaw um and also miss wanda gilbert coker who has been very involved with the community in Raleigh for as long as I can remember. And some of them, so I guess a brief overview of the issue. This is a zoning case that would essentially lead to removal of the historic overlay that's been protecting Shaw University from gentrification, from gentrification and displacement. So, depending on how the, how the city council will vote on this issue next Tuesday on May 2nd, it would determine uh, if they vote yes, then the historic overlay will be removed and essentially turning Shaw University into a, just not a part of the commercial district that allow, that will open the place up for private businesses to come in and basically buy up a lot of places and, um, Essentially, not essentially not um, caring for the historical and cultural aspect of Shaw University, given that this is a major HBCU in the city. Okay, is this is this something that's that's facilitated from without Shaw, or is it facilitated from within Shaw? And by, by by that I mean are the administration the administrators of Shaw behind this or they are for this or against this or what are, as far as you know what are some of the positions that you've heard 
based on my understanding, um, Dr. Paul Dillard and the Board of Trustees have been pushing for this redevelopment of Shaw. So they are in support of this, but um, they have been pushed back from Shaw alumni and the community at large. Large one of the major issue is that despite pushing for this redevelopment, there has been no master plan provided for the community to be able to review and comment and provide feedback on what should be best uh, for the, for the, not just for the community but also for the black students who are at Shaw University. Hmm. Well, I was I was uh, looking at uh, some of the the previous or one of the previous. Um, city council meetings when they were discussing this. Um, and uh, there's some things that I, I I think stand out to me. One of the things is that they're changing, they wanna change from an industrial, from I'm sorry, institutional to a central business district. And to me, that seems very suspect. I, I don't know, maybe I'm not interpreting it right, but if you're an institutional, if you're on an institutional situation or platform, it seems like you're, your your primary focus would be education, would be the maintaining the institution. Why would why would they want to change that to a business um, district, which invites other types of priorities into the into the mix? Right. So this is my understanding of the situation, and this is why I uh, discussed with Ms. Wanda Kibakoka and also another um, black organizer in Raleigh, Ms. Octavia Rainey. Um, both of them mentioned to me that Shaw University is caught up in this whole situation in downtown Raleigh, known as the Downtown Raleigh Alliance. And mm -hmm. Dr. Paula Dillard is part of the Downtown Raleigh Alliance, which means if, if you if she's part of if she's part of that group, that means that you know she will have priority outside of what the students need and right. ideal, in an ideal situation if you're an educator you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't put private in financial in or profit interest over that of the students but that's the situation as that especially if, if it involves um from my point of view the the eradication of a of a landmark of a symbol that's a historical symbol uh, relative to the education of, of our culture um and I think that's, to me, that's why, um, you know, I participate in the White, White County Housing Justice Coalition. Um, I'm, I'm just learning a lot of stuff about Raleigh and, and, and you know, Eastern North Carolina, different, because I'm basically from up north. But um, I've been down here about seven years and I'm seeing things that are, that are similar to the justification, the, uh, the gentrification that took place in, in the north, like in turn in New York and in, in other other places where communities were taken over, uh, landmarks were destroyed. Um, you know, the driving force was economics, was the financial gain of a few at the expense of the indigenous folk in that community, um, who who respect and 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 cherish some of the landmark and some of the the uh, institutions that they have long supported and have been a part of the culture. So, I mean, it's 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 very um, disheartening if, if I'm understanding it correctly to see that you know the gentrification is is being or or land theft is being as they call it in some in some circles land theft is being facilitated um, through gentrification and addressed at some of our our landmarks. Um, what are some of the the uh, the city council positions that you're aware of are they what are, how do they justify this if you know from your from your understanding i actually am not too sure exactly how the city council will vote on this um to my understanding um some of the council members have commented that um they are they want to hear from all sides of the situation to understand the situation. And I know there's uh, council members who said that they will to ensure they prioritize of, uh, of, uh, addressing affordable housing needs when considering this case. 
Um, also, my, my other understanding is they want uh, at least some of the council members would like to vote based on um, what they would understand to be the most anti-racist position. Mm. So really? one of the biggest push would be for them to understand that if they vote yes, that would actually bring more harm to the students and to the com to the black community. Okay, so I mean, would you say that uh, this is an economic issue um, in terms of uh, supporting or, or facilitating the agenda of of people's greed, or would you say it's a racial issue? That 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 is um, that is is about uh, uh, supremacy, white supremacy, or about about racism, um, or is it a, a little bit of both? I think there is a need to look into this from this intersectionality involved. I think it's, a, it's definitely a little bit of both, because uh, if we are going to talk about um, economics, well. There's there's place this could be a place to discuss um, you know ec economics for the black community. I'll bring in something that Miss Wanda would like for me to bring up if that's all right. Um, let's see. So for I mean for one thing, it let's see. So the city of Raleigh they put a lot of focus on making downtown Raleigh strive. Whenever people come to visit Raleigh, the city of Raleigh would really want to direct them to whatever downtown Raleigh has to offer. Right. So for example, you know, most recently we have the Dreamville Music Festival. Um, so that's an, that's an example of that, like, uh, but then Ms. Wanda would tell you that if she was to go to if she and her family was to go to a city for an event, they would first thing first, they want to go to check out um, what local black owned businesses are there. Like could be a, for example, she gave me this uh, is seafood restaurant in Forsyth County that was owned, that was uh, owned by a black family for three generations, places like that. Now, now ironically, there's been so much displacement going on in downtown Raleigh that right now there are only two black owned restaurants where they, whereas they used to be countless in the past. If you hear from black residents who live in Raleigh for decades um, of the black owned business opportunity for people who could afford to live downtown in the past, that's not, that's not really the case anymore. Um, so, and you know, right now the city they are they are trying to find and convince black owned businesses to come to downtown Raleigh, but they couldn't. Um, especially with like enterprise loans and grants and the black community had to jump through hoops that the white counterparts did not have to. If you start seeing that, then you start seeing where the city did not take care of certain parts of downtown Raleigh, like College Park, and you know, they call those places blighted, letting these places go down. And we're just all coming together to make sure that we well, initially want to make sure black community can provide. So that force people to sell or move out with what they have. Mm -hmm. And with those businesses where there's low income apartments, it comes through and tore down the places. So like, you know, they did all the damages in the past and now they, they're trying to, the city is trying to get some of them to like come back here. So that's, there's that irony. You know, you want black, you want black owned businesses, you want, you know, black community to to be here, and yet you're doing all these things that prevent them from being able to do business here or to live here. I mean, in fact, like um, I know that the city is trying to convince a couple of black-owned businesses to come to downtown Raleigh, but they can't because the taxes that they had to pay if they were to run a business here is also very, is also difficult to like achieve. It's not just property tax to live here, but also taxes if you are run business here. So that's just a, so yeah. It's a bit of race. It's a bit of um, economics. Uh, I'd like to uh, jump in if I could, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you because I mean, you have a history in North Carolina, and um, and I, I mean, I don't want to preempt what you're going to say, but um, I, I think this is something that 
it's not just happening in Raleigh. I mean, Raleigh is what we're we're dealing with now because of the the urgency of trying to save Shaw University as it was um, as it was landmarked, right? Um, but you know, we see similar things. I know you're you're out there in business, you're out there in, in the community, you're out there trying to facilitate um, preservation of things that are are meaningful to the community as as, as a whole, and specifically certain cultural. Um, uh, issues within the community. So uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I would appreciate your perspective on on what you see and what you hear or are talking about and how you see that happening, you know, in other parts of North Carolina. I I, um, I want to ask a simple question. It seems like you're uh, a bit skeptical because you feel like that you have indications that this could be a Trojan horse here. That they're going to come in under the guise of uh, restoration, developing things, business. But do you feel like Shaw University is in danger? Is that what I'm hearing from you, Mr. Thomas or Mr. Y? Is that a possibility that the university could be forced to to move, relocate, or or close? Or well, the dynamic of the university is is at risk, right? The dynamic and, and the, the cultural relevance of the university, I think, is at risk, which okay. ultimately will change the, the, the whole perspective of the university. And I and and I some of the historic relevance of that university will 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 be be eradicated. That that's how I I'm, that's yeah. what I'm getting from from the conversation yeah. I've heard. I got you. And, and so thus, uh I gotta say at this point, until the data is in, until they do the proper um, I wouldn't say symposium, a collaborative effort to do the surveys and get the community uh, input. Just looking from the outside in, I'm for improvement. I think that they should, you, you look at their own assessment of the neighborhood, and I'm sure they have a 10-year plan, uh, a five-year plan to improve the campus, to make it grow. I, I can't I'm from uh, the New Bern area. If you look at New Bern, they have a huge effort to preserve the historical environment and context of New Bern. Uh, they did that and still, uh, uh, what you say, made room for growth and development, small amounts of growth and development in that area. Those homes need to be repaired. There's standards, there's colors, there's, there's various things that you have to adhere to. And for the record on the show, I want to read the definition of regentrification. And one simple definition says the restoration and upgrading of deteriorating urban property by middle class or affluent people, often resulting in displacement of lower income people. So you get to make your own recipe for the campus. If they vote yes, why would they disregard the campus and what their needs are and the preserving the historical value and the appearance, if not improve it, I think you have to have a, a future plan. And I believe unless they're just purely picking on that area, isolating that area and taking advantage of that area because of the weaknesses, as he was just speaking, uh, Blacks can't afford to have a business downtown or they can't afford to be involved in the regentrification process to make sure that they are represented fairly and equal with the new businesses, which should be catering to students. Like here in Greenville, a lot of these bars, a lot of these things cater to uh, ECU and the businesses supplement the development in this area and they get more of the same. But that's that, that seems to be, um... Uh, the difference in in my view, if I'm under, like I say, if I'm understanding it correctly, in say here in Greenville and ECU, um, is that it's not a historically black college, right? Um, right. And I and I think that there is a certain there's a certain relevance in preserving the the historic value, the historic um, uh, relevance of a of a uh, historically black college, so and I think. Um, sorry, can I just well. two points? One of them is 
Prince Hall District, what remains of it, is one of the last remaining historic black district in downtown Raleigh. That's being targeted. Right, right. Is that that's being targeted down. for the next rezoning case after this Char University zoning case. So to and tear it down. Yeah, to tear it down and erase. And that's the another point I want to bring okay. up. Is that there's a difference between restoration, which the city has not shown interest in doing, and tear down and building some building something that's for like luxury or mix mixed income. Now, here's the thing. Um, this is a this is a this is a, um, a pattern that the city of Raleigh has done ye for years. Um, in downtown Raleigh, there used to be three public housing properties in the area. Um, I, re I can recall two of them. They tore, they have came through and tore down Walnut Terrace at, and they put in place a version of Walnut Terrace that's more difficult for people to get into. Um, and same for Shavers Park, which also used to have public housing there. Maybe you, I, I believe one of the oldest public housing in the area that was torn down, and the people who used to be there couldn't get back in there. Now, I, li I like what you said. Excuse the interruption. Public yeah. housing was a trap. It still is, and once it served its purpose, it should be dismantled. Uh, I, I think to to capture single moms in a place where dads aren't really welcome and they can't really host a family. The oldest of public housings are probably over here in the New Bern area, James City, Trent Court, uh, some of the oldest in North Carolina, at least I say. Now, they, they really should be uh, dismantled and um, they should be getting townhomes. I think they should be replaced. Uh, people should have uh, opportunity to become homeowners and not spend the rest of their life in a in a in a public housing but the historical value of that in the college uh to me is is two different things though yeah no well, it's, back it's, my time so yeah no it's okay i just want to make the point about the whole thing with like what is the difference between tearing something down and replacing it so as opposed to just restoring it so that one other point is like um kind of want to talk about housing just a little bit if you don't mind let's talk let let's disregard the, uh, the title of public housing for a minute there. Um, this is something that the city, this is another thing that city Raleigh has been doing where they essentially have been ignoring the actual need for building housing that's affordable to low income families. Now it doesn't have to be public housing, but it needs to be housing for low income. And the outgoing director of housing and neighborhood Larry Jarvis for years since he he's taken his job he's uh he's leaving in a I think he's leaving either like now or in a couple months yeah like he has been he is he has the analysis he has an analysis and report that has shown that what's really needed is housing for low income not housing for sixty percent AMI or eighty percent AMI housing for low income that means thirty percent AMI or below but the city has been ignore has been ignoring that and avoiding having to do that for a very long time and that's it i mean that's the, i mean that's the bare minimum like if you want to build you gotta have to you have to build housing for low income because like to at least to match the income of the low income families that's you what know? i was saying where's the income where's the minimum wage is it a living wage in raleigh if you know if you build if you don't build low income housing and you're paying your people still nine ten dollars an hour that's pretty much the poverty line is well below the poverty line i think the poverty line is about thirty five thousand dollars a year so you got to have housing for people that make thirty five thousand dollars a year or less so that dictates what you guys got to build to you yeah. know to live in that area yeah is, is that the same is that the same kind of mentality or or agenda that's happening at Shaw in terms of the economic impact. Uh, would you, you know, I think it's comparable to what's happening in housing um, in terms of economics than what's happening in Shaw in terms of economics. And the thing that I think um, is is interesting to me, to say the least, is that the administration of Shaw seems to be somewhat on board with this. Well, they feel like stakeholders then. They feel like they're going to have 
Like I say, it could be a Trojan horse, but I think they're looking at getting an influx of cash that's going to help them adjust to the uh, regentrification that's going to happen in that area. And it, like I said, to summarize what I said, I know I interrupted, but I guess they feel like stakeholders and they finally get an opportunity to renovate some campus, maybe build some new buildings. Or I think they're feeling if they're on board with it, then obviously they feel like they're well established. But then you have the you have the indigenous community uh, um, that that is saying, well, no, this is something that we feel that we're connected to, and we don't we don't think that is it should eradicate you know that progress should eradicate the, the historical reality of, of the of the community, um, and I think that's in a lot of ways that's always been the conflict, right? Um, progress yeah. at, progress at what expense and at whose expense, right? Um, how do you preserve the, the history uh, and you move forward in, in terms of uh, evolution, you know, the the evolution of, of a city? Um, and I understand that, but I mean, it seems to always be on the backs of, of low income people, the back of, of uh, culturally ignored people, the back of the backs of of um, the the indigenous people and in, 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 uh, the low income indigenous people in, in the communities. So mm. how do you how do you balance that? I mean that seems to be the the um, the issue, and I know Wanda is very is very um, articulate about about how to do that and the the impact of that and um, that it's 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 you know it has racial implications um, that are that are far beyond the economic the economic realities, but I think the economic realities do are are part of the um, the problem um and it does impact a a certain culture more than others yeah it should those inner city neighborhoods should have a chance and people living there should have a chance to keep their land if they can economically stand it when the when the third aspect of regentrification that i was doing my study in is the values go up and that's where the displacement starts and it's creating a lot of homeless people uh even people that you know typically don't profile as homeless people. People sleeping on sofas at mama's house. If you read the definition of homelessness, they're actually homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they sleeping at a friend's house on the sofa. Yeah. But uh, yes, you are absolutely right. And But over time, people are going to die out. They're going to move. The air is going to become a slum if there's not new uh, blood going in. So I think it's a catch-22. Regentrification you can take place organically. Um, you do it yourself or somebody's going to do it. And I think cities have just been eyeballing inner cities and they snuck up on everybody. All right, we're in here now. We're buying up the property too late. And, that, and I think that's that, that's essentially um, one of the problems that, you know, that, that, that the indigenous people of the community face is that once you bring in outside investors, outside uh, uh, um developers it changes the economic progress it changes the economic reality the dynamic right um so that people who are who are who are there and, and live on uh, low incomes or fixed incomes can no longer can no longer afford the, the to live in the city or to you know or institutions like Shaw can have a hard time functioning because of the the economics of the of the of the surrounding the surrounding city, and that's something I think needs that that has to be mitigated by cities, right? It, you know, you can't you can't just just forego the 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 desires and the the realities of people who who um who have been there for for decades and say, well, this is this is what we want as well. Right, um, and this is what we can afford. So you you're pricing us out now. You want to take over our institutions. You want to take over our, our housing. What are we supposed to do? I blame the city council people. I blame the government for not informing whatever class, poor, middle class, or rich, for not informing people living in inner cities that 30 years is all you got, bro. These houses are going to be depreciating. This land, the city is going to be moving to another area. Things are going to be redeveloping. <clears throat> So, you know, 30 years, but nobody was telling me. I just learned that about a year and a half ago, about 30 years and how long a city stays and how it grows. But city council people wouldn't go in there and say, don't 
spend your whole life here or don't plan to spend your whole life here, have your two or three, four, five kids, let them graduate and think about moving out there to Rock Springs or think about moving out, have a goal in mind instead of the homestead philosophy that you have when you're living in the country. It's different. And I think we're talking over Mr. Uh, uh, Hung up there. <laughs> No, it's okay. No, it's just like I just want to bring a couple more, um, I guess, facts into the con to, into the context. I don't have the exact number on hand right now, but my understanding is there's Shaw University has, I want to say, pretty huge acres of land that they could utilize to establish a black-owned agro cultural business if they if they would if they should if they decide to but to my understanding they're not really doing that i mean one of the things is like you know, we talk about bringing in outside investor to bring money in but what about uh, make, but like whenever a city gets money whenever the institution gets money do the people on the ground ever see that money that's it that's mm -hmm. one thing keep in mind. i mean it's like if you know people on the ground have have it, you able to have like means of production, you able to see the means of production, you able to be, generate what generate um circuit people part of the circ actual circulation of the um economy, if you will. That that could make that could that could lead to a whole different way that the community would would establish itself. And but then I don't feel like not just Raleigh. I feel like most cities don't see, don't have, don't seem to have an interest in, you know, entrusting the people on the ground with that capacity or the ability to be able to like see that means of production. It's always been trusting the corporates to say, "Hey, um, come, come on down here and give us that money." Is it? And this is the other thing is um, Shaw University has not provided a master plan for the students to review, for the, uh, for the people in the community to review and decide, hey, how do we want to build this? That has not been out there yet. They want yeah. to approve it and then do the plan later, which is basically equivalent doing a, writing a, asking a city to write them a blank check and then they do whatever they, whatever they want with it once it's been approved. This is, this is not, it's not new, just it isn't just the case for Shaw University. A couple of years ago, City Raleigh basically did the same thing with another area that they now call downtown South, where they basically write a blank check with no plan for like how you're going to ensure that there's gonna be affordable housing or housing for low income. They have they, they just again blank check for the for the private developers and then um once that's once that's true, let them decide what it is. But then it's like once you approve it, once you approve a plan, you can't really like set conditions. I know there's a whole a lot of pushback on that, saying that oh, it's um, North Carolina doesn't let you let you do that, but you can still record, you can still um, just have like voluntary inclusionary zoning and such. So it's it's not like we have no, the city has no way of working with people who are filing applications and like, hey, what do we want to do for this place? Like, why isn't, that's the ongoing question. That, why is it that, the, why is it so difficult for the city to trust people to decide what they want to do with their lives? I think that's a very fundamental question. Well, I, I, think, think that they, I think the agenda, yeah. They have a, uh, and that's the key, right? What you just said, sir, is, is being able to trust the people with their own future. I was listening to that board meeting that you sent and, and one of the gentlemen said, your age plus how long your residents have been there should justify a lot of free things, free taxes, blah, blah, blah. I think you used that formula. So you should be able to live out the rest of your life or if you're retired, then that's your, that is your homestead. So I'm for that and that should have a lot of weight against a developer coming in. Uh, I don't trust, uh, I'm kind of like you, Thomas, I don't trust that they're going to maintain the identity of the college as a historical university. I don't trust that. Uh, even though I believe the the college should have a future of probably building a new campus uh, anyways, regardless, or upgrading that one, tearing down some buildings and dedicating a new one. Uh, I think that that should always be a possibility, but I think 
we need to let them decide that those people in that area. Now, the reason I was talking reality when I first started speaking is capitalism don't have no friends. The economy of Raleigh is going to prevail. Well, I think, yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think that um, your, your analysis is, is on point. But I do think that oftentimes the, the, the mindset or the, 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 the um, I, I, I guess, the, the indoctrination, or for, for lack of a better word, of, of, of people in a community has to be about preserving their community, right? It has to be about what what can I do? How can I get involved in because in 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 preserving what I feel is is relative to to historically and economically? Um, I can't always leave it in the hands of others, right? Because others are going to facilitate their agenda, right? And and if they have the the economic power or the political power to do so, that's what that's what they're going to do, all right? Um, and so I think in in terms of uh, yes. Shaw University, it do, you know, does have to does have to progress, but it it has to progress according to the dynamic that it has established, right? It 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 should progress in terms of the 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 original intent uh, and of the educational agenda um, mm -hmm. as related to a culture um, and those some of the symbolic buildings and symbolic institutions there. May have to may have to evolve in a way, but they still should maintain that uh, that that dynamic that's relative to the education of of a culture, all right? And that uh, to me, that's that's what's essential, you know. If, if they're doing that, Mr. Thomas, if they're doing it, a lot of the city, like right here in Greenville, right along this Fifth Street area where gentrification took, a lot of those homeowners were out of state. A lot of the homeowners in different places weren't able to really be functioning stakeholders in the growth of that area because they didn't have the money to to um, upgrade their house. Right. So you know, and the city does have to grow, and the city does need to take on a, a personality and characteristics, uh, and it should balance out with: Are we going to make a certain amount of people homeless? Then we should put this out five years, get in there, renovate some. Uh, they do, and they did, give out grants to renovate houses. I think we started out the show talking about things that are available. Uh, but as far as the college is concerned, the alumni uh, should get serious. I know in black colleges, a lot of the alumni don't have big booster clubs, and they don't donate back to the colleges. Like, Well, that's what I'm hearing, okay? I'm not there. So... The college has to maintain that identity, and they have to stand up for themselves right now. Um, and I think if they have a leadership in place that says, we're going to go with this, then they could be getting bamboozled because there definitely better be research done. And the data should come back in as to how it's going to be affecting the area and how it's going to take place and how the college is going to be treated. But I think he was saying giving the developers a blank check. Well, I think when you turn turn to the if they get overruled and they remove this uh, grandfather that they have or protection that they have over the college, the developers could go in there and put anything. They might well, you know, within yeah. reasoning, but they're gonna take off, and you go. It's gonna be like a bull trying to keep oh, yeah. them from building stuff that's not that's not in the best interest of the college. Yeah, and also then that's why I was brought up earlier. Like when, like should Shaw University get approved next on the chopping block is Prince Hall District or what remains of its history there? That's next, and so that's the other thing. And one other point about the Shaw students from Miss Wanda that I want to bring up. Um, I mentioned we mentioned that we talked a little bit earlier about the businesses, um, about the taxes they had to pay to have to have business in downtown Raleigh. Again, this is the issue which our downtown Raleigh Alliance has been operating essentially though like if like with the gentrification that goes through, there would be no we wouldn't we would not expect any black owned businesses in the area to be owned by Shaw graduates and because they can't even afford to live there. And people who work at Shaw can't afford to live there because looking at solely and that's the other thing with how the city look at housing. Um, 
they look at it almost solely on supply and demand and not looking at whether or not that's actually affordable to the people who actually lived in the community. And to give a context about downtown Raleigh, a lot of the housing that um, they want to build there is essentially more meant for high paying tech employees like Red Hat, for example. And, um, you know, if you re rank pick, here's a, here's a question um, from Ms. Wanda. It's like, why don't, why, why, does it, why isn't there like a program to like help train people in the black community to to be able to work at Red Hat, for example. Like, I mean, that that probably like be like ten years of training to catch up or something along the line. But it's just like now we also got to look at what kind of job. Who, who would who would who would facilitate and create and facilitate facilitate that that training? Another good question. I mean, would would do we do we have to figure out? Um, how we as the people in the community can can bring forth this training are we looking elsewhere for that training to take well that that comes through let's say here mr thomas we have a economical board of development you can go there through the chamber of commerce and they sit and plan and invite different industries to come to greenville they customize training at the community college that can produce workers in the area that can work at these companies so the answer to your question i believe is yes the economical development is the Raleigh, the city's responsibility on to bring in different things that can help people live and improve the quality of life. Um, but if they, if they don't, then what is the responsibility of the people that it impacts to try to, or, 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 the, or the culture that it impacts to try to make these things happen from within? Yeah, they're going to look at it. Uh, well, one, you're going to be underprivileged, underserved, and you're going to get pushed out, okay? Because you probably can't, you won't have a business that you're going to allow to, to move down there to that area that can affect people's salary. Uh, mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is the people that live around the campus, the ECU campus here, they can afford to pay $1,000 a month to live in off-campus living, mm -hmm. to live in these luxury apartments. And they are some luxury ones right around the cop. They can't do that from what I'm listening to. They can't do that around that campus. So in other words, they're signing the death certificate for a long term, really, if the college mm -hmm. don't just redo everything, because gentrification is a, a, a machine. And that area, if it does look bad, if it looks old and dilapidated and outdated, either they're going to get it now or they're going to get it 10 years from now. So, I mean, so I think one of the, one of the issues at hand is that when they're in in the planning stages and and in the uh, the conceptualization stages of this, like you know, within the city council and other and other platforms, the input of the community members is essential. But um, has yeah. it not, has that not been happening? And yeah, they're gonna get it. That has not been happening. It's it's been people who are who are uh, are presenting themselves as spokespeople people for people in the community and who are not, who don't really have the community's interest. I mean, yeah. um, if the community is, in, in, is um, you know, saying, well, we, we want to move forward. We want to see progress at Shaw University. We want to see um, the, the uh, facilitation of, of, of modern, of a modernization efforts there. Um, then, then uh, we as the community, or for that, but it has to be, it, it, you know, in my view, it should be about bringing that compute that community input into the into the process so that it can be it, it it can reflect what the community feels is necessary, what the community what the community feels is relative to 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 their 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 current existence and to perpetuating a the the historical relevance of that of that institution. Um, and yeah. I think that's that's a, part, a big part of what's missing from what I understand. Only yeah. if it can so, survive. Yeah. So one thing I want to bring up is that you know the, well, we talk about capitalism a little bit. The capital. I mean the the basic of the capitalist model is that they're not interested in building community. They're interested for capitalism. I'll, I'll give it. I'll give you a, an example. Um, you know, generally, when you when you trade for things with with currency, you know the the end product is you know the manufactured product that you're trying to get. With capitalism, their end their end product is more money. 
that the product is just a means to get more money. And so, like, I can see why, you know, in the capitalist system, you're not, the corporates are not interested in, in spending that time and money to train people. They will, so if they can like hire some, they can convince someone from Silicon Valley, California to come over to Raleigh to just do just get st- get started on working right away. They would do that. It, it saves them money and allows them to have like higher profit. But uh, that's the uh, thing. That's, that's the thing. I feel like that's it. This is also why I feel like we need to stop thinking that way about like oh we need to make cash fast. <laughs> um, you, if we want to build community, we need to just like first dismantling that mindset of the get, of the get cash fast right. idea to be able to build, start thinking more on how do we build the community because it was the current system, the, cur- it, the current system is not interested in building community. But that's the other thing is that we need, this is also why we need to start having conversations like this to make space to have conversation, to make space for the community to have conversation. Like to this day, the city is not like the city is not interested in bringing the community to have discussion. Like I remember years ago when the city of Raleigh is trying to, to uh, ha- create a community wide climate action plan. I put my name in there because you know environmental justice is something I care about. You know, I wrote, I think I checked in. I am interested in. And having in joining meeting that discusses you know, land use, um, if there's any meeting that talk about like how to establish affordable housing, you know, is how to protect, how to have more net conservation. Um, I was not invited to any of the meeting until months and months later, like the week before Thanksgiving. I was invited to a meeting to talk about to where I'm the only community member and everyone else was a staff from the city. And I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who is not white in that in that meeting of seven people. And they just talk about they all just talk about waste management. And it was already toward the end stage of their planning. And they did not I put some other names in there too for the people who I feel like would be good for the invite meeting. I'm pretty sure they didn't invite a single one of them. And that's how the city has been off. I'm giving you an example of how the city operates in terms of building a community-wide climate action plan. Uh, well, I'd like to see what Shaw has uh, internally to see what their plans are for the next 5, 10, 20 years because they, I think they would need to lead the effort to preserve the campus. The alumni yeah. would need to step up and say, these are the plans that we have. And if I was the mayor of the city or if that was my district as a uh, city council, then I'd have to go in the best interest of my constituents. So that's what you asked when we first came on, Mr. Thomas. That was the $100,000 question. Uh, Have we surveyed the the city council? What are their their plans and what are the the, the discussions that's going on? If you just headed towards a vote, then they likely already got their mind made up. And uh, I can't imagine that we're the only three that don't know what's going on. There's some decisions. There's a lot of debate going on in the background internally at Shaw. And uh, if they're taking federal funds Mm -hmm. at Shaw, then a lot of this could be related to their opportunities or threats. That's what SWAT is, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And everybody with any type of organization uses that that model. Yeah, for the record, my 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 understanding is Shaw University does take Pell Grant, which is federal. Right. Yeah. So um yeah, so there's there's that. But yeah, again this goes back to like where is that master plan? Um yeah. one of the council member council member Jane Harrison during the meeting last month commented that like you know, she's also so Council Member Jane Harrison at City Raleigh, she is also a professor at North Carolina State University, and she commented on, you know, uh, whenever there's something similar is going on for NC State, you know, there would be a master plan. So yeah, she was also asking where's the master plan? Yeah. Where is the master plan? <laughs> and that's, that's really what the Francisco is asking for. Where is it? Well, um, I'd like to see y'all have in. one too, because if you go if we, if they get past it this time. Are you going to leave the area looking like this, or, or are you going to work with the city to get different businesses down there to, to you know, to enhance what's there? Um, 
you know. Not eradicate it, enhance it. Right, exactly. Yeah, are you going to take care of the area now? Like I say, I'm just imagining if I'm mayor, I'm, I'm developing every area, every weakness. I don't want to see old public housing. I want those places painted. I want them looking nice. Same way we're doing here in Greenville. They got shutters now to replace all the doors. I don't want to look at nothing like a, uh, what you call that, projects. Mm. Because they should all be repurposed in 10 years and it should be just apartments. Well, okay, um, and they don't need to look all the same. So you see all the, in Florida, 20 years ago I was there and, and somebody said, hey, there's the projects. I'm like, what? They look like our townhomes even 20 yeah. years ago. They didn't build projects like we build them here in North Carolina, looking like yeah. prisons or something. So I wouldn't want Shaw looking like that 10 years from now. So you got to show me a plan of development. Yeah. You know, but uh, you can't show me anything, and the citizens and the alumni don't want it. it it's about to go down. Capitalism. It's going to be bars around there. It's going to be uh, stores, and yes, the wealthy people going to move in, and those people are going to get the AMI is going to go up, and then people are not, definitely not going to be yeah. able to. to it's a wrap. Yeah. So the tax, I mean, it's going to go up, and I and I so you know I don't want to I don't want to uh, get into uh, the the strategic um planning of, of, of how this is going to be addressed but there is there is there any any leverage points that that you feel the community has in terms of dealing with with um shaw and getting them to to reveal their plan without getting too much into your strategy well well um i would say one thing that Wake County Health and Justice Coalition is doing is putting pressure on the city council before their vote next Tuesday. That's one thing. Yeah, next Tuesday, we have, right. We have, a letter, we have a letter campaign that we're trying to get people to sign and submit. Um, once you click send, it will get it will go toward the city councilors and mayor and also the Department of Education to, to get them to become aware of what's going on here. And really. So if you don't mind, can I share the link here somehow? Um, it's basically bit.ly slash, slash safeshaw. Um, you can share that link. That will take you to the letter campaign. And at the very least, you can get people to sign up there. One of, oh, sorry. One of the things I wanted to bring, I want to bring up as question, and just so I can put that on, put this on record here. Questions that besides, you know, Besides enhancing the housing and stuff like that, here's, I was I'm also wondering. In addition to those plans, what is the if the if Shaw University gets more money, uh, is that is that gonna mean higher salary for its faculty and staff? That's another thing. What about insurance? What about insurance plans or health insurance or that kind of stuff for the employees? And also, like, what about you know? programs educational programs that will ensure that when shaw university students graduate that they can be guaranteed a job maybe even here in raleigh like if they can like if they can if there's program that allows them to like work and live in raleigh then you know this is this is one of the ways that the com that black community in the area can thrive that was yeah. You know, questions to think about, but yeah, if po if folks can sign and share as widely as possible the letter campaign that Wake County House and Justice Coalition has put together, bit.ly slash save Shaw. That's uh, that's the letter campaign. And, okay. Uh, if well, you can, um, can, yeah. you, can you, coach, is there a way you can save this link? Is there a way that I can save this link? Yeah, like I know if you're on Zoom, you can go in the chat and, and, and copy it. How does that work on this platform? Um, put it in the chat, and I believe it'll be there. It's in the chat now. It is yeah, it's in the chat now. Right? Yeah, I see it in there. Uh, I see a bubble there. I see it in the chat now. So, yeah, it'll be there during the regular broadcast of this or rebroadcast. Um, oh, okay. I think the incentives that he was just talking about, uh, really, I think, between the president and the mayor and I think it is a very, very big issue. I appreciate your advocacy uh, and what you're doing, even coming on to the show. And we're not indigenous to that area. And I, I, I take my hat off to you, my brother. And uh, <laughs> thank you for advocating for historical um, black uh, university. It's amazing. 
I are mean, you an I, advocate or are you just a, a student there? What's your affiliation with the organization? With Wake County Health Justice Coalition or with Shaw University? Shaw University. I have no personal connection with Shaw University. I, I am with the Wake County Housing Justice Coalition. Yes, the coalition. Life. Okay, so you um, are you know, There are people there who are alumni, who are affiliated with the students there. Um, you know, they they can't be everywhere at once. So the least I could do is that if, you know, since Miss Wanda, Miss Keisha can't be here, I want to at least be able to like serve as their messenger, okay. if nothing else. I'm Thank just really. Everything I said today is just messages from Ms. Wanda Gilbert-Kovaker, Ms. Octavia Rainey, who are two of the longtime Black organizers in Raleigh, and also Ms. Keisha Monk, who, by the way, is the niece of Thelonious Monk. Wow. She's also working on Save Our Shaw. Well, I believe it's a whole lot of work being done behind the scenes, and uh, I think they'll have the best shot that they can get. But with a vote coming up next Tuesday, and we don't have any type of survey or um the public um because i was looking at the public forum and they wouldn't let them talk about it in one aspect of it so i guess they had brought it up in another part mm. um i would think it would be droves of people standing up to you know speak yeah. on opposing this thing there were 140 people standing in opposition to that to that case on um, in April, and the mayor still only allowed for like eight minutes each side, which makes it very little opportunity for people for the general public to say anything. I mean, the mayor gets. I mean, like the mayor, for the mayor to be able to arbitrarily dictate, oh, this is how I want this this hearing to run, is um, quite authoritative. Honestly, that's is no, this it's, late? How long has this been in the place? Sometimes we don't watch our meetings and our this planning is, meetings. This could have been in plan three years ago. The when we ask, is this late? Or do you mean like what time the meeting, the hearing is? Or what do no, you mean? No, I mean as, as this plan, been a plan, yeah. a forecast, a, a developmental proposal four years from uh, ago, three years ago implemented in a 10-year plan or a three-year plan in which cities normally do uh or sometimes they do in order to forecast a new area they're going to build uh where they're going to expand that next i know winterville uh, i can just speak from experience they invited us to plenty of meetings mm. uh, three years ago talking about the new uh, commercial expansion they were going to do because they had a bypass coming it's going to take off 30 percent of the traffic from the highway so was this, you know, foreseeable? Well, or did Shaw did Shaw get in, involved in in, in um, putting out a plan and 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 uh, uh, like uh, predicting what what they're going to do and seeing what's going to happen? You know, to I mean, there's there's bound to, there has I mean I'm expecting there were meetings in the past, but like whether or not they were transparent, that's a whole other thing. I mean, like, oh, okay, I mean, has yeah. been. Ms. Keisha has been pushing back on this among, along with other organizers in the area for some time now. I personally heard about it more prominently, I want to say this past January, but I know it has been going on for longer, but it's just, um, this hearing is coming, I think the hearing is coming up is when the next things are gearing up for like people to step up. Well, if they vote against it, am I assuming that that's when they're going to do the analysis, uh, have more public input to try and get a, you know, get it done and push past a no vote. So I would say that, like for instance, like back in April, in April when they were having this public hearing, that's when, you know, between April fourth to like May second, like there should be meetings and discussions going on, like public, like. I, that should be open to the public, but so far it's been, I would say, I would just have to be out, be honest, it's been pretty quiet, which is what's concerning for me. It's just like, mm, uh, yeah. if they if they vote, like if they vote no next Tuesday, like it still comes down to like what, how they're going to open, like they, ideally, I would like to see that uh, Shaw University opens up to um, the the students, the alumni, the community, the black community to like look at, like talk about what they want to envision in their master plan. 
like that would be a, you know, having a transparent process and that's part of the letter campaign that we put in i'll just say it here you know for, you know the community the we can help just coalition we demand that i rise to the council vote no on z5922 on shaw university if the city council truly intends to be anti-racist anti-bigoted this council must vote no until the shaw university ensure ample open and transparent opportunity for the local taxpayers in Raleigh to come to the table to view, comment on, and approve a potential master plan that will truly benefit the Shaw University students, as well as the overall HBCU cultural legacy, rather than opening the place up for white capitalistic exploitations. So that's the, yeah. that's the idea. All right. And, and what, are, what are some of the, the, the potential Political allies in this process. Would you think the federal government or some, or the, you know, the State Department of Education, the federal government, the the, the National Department of Education, um, could be used as leverage in, in some regards? Um, I think that. Um, yeah, I, I think that if, if, if you know, right. Uh, like I say, I don't want to get too much into the strategy, but there has to be some leverage points, right? And I think that um, some of those leverage points need to be activated before Tuesday. Yeah, reparations. They can be like, reparations oh, and uh, right. can stay put forever without fear of regentrification. Mm -hmm. so some type of move, you know, Asheville, the Asheboro uh, approved reparations. Uh, a lot of cities across the United States are working on that right now just to do something for black people. And uh, when they are found to be uh, disadvantaged or have been moved this place before, mm. so reparations, uh, that's not a just a thought anymore. Yeah, the, 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 um, the vote is coming up Tuesday, all right? Yeah. And so I think that there's some kind of action or, or, or I guess um, uh, uh, a leverage needs to be needs to be you know discussed within within certain certain uh silos so that um there may be a way to 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 deal with that vote um additionally we need to think about what beyond tuesday right yeah absolutely what are some of the some of the alternatives that that we can facilitate beyond tuesday if the vote does not go as 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 we would hope it would um that's not the end all i think that we have to figure out what are, what are the you know what are the steps after that as well? So yeah, I mean at the end of the day, it is about. I mean Raleigh still has black community that can that we that's that deserve protection, and it, at the end of the day, it 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 boils down to whatever it takes to protect the black community from gentrification, displacement from Raleigh. Um, what that is that that involves conversation that goes beyond just the three of us. It needs to be a conversation that that involves the. The community at large and the other thing is i just want to also comment uh, for example like i this this is just gonna affect shaw this is gonna be extending all the way to new burn corridor because you know city of raleigh is also looking at um the transit or, or um, the transit um i forgot what tld stands for but basically the bus rapid transit the new burn corridor that's another fight that's going on so it's a it's a huge swath of land that has uh, historical and cultural value for the black community that needs to be protected. So, you know, this and, is that, and there's, you know, in, along with that cultural and, and, and historical benefit, there's an economic component that that um, should, that the, the black community should benefit from these lands. Um, yeah. there's, 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 you know, it's 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 about it's it's a number of things that that are at stake right um and that and that has to be filtered out and 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 brought to the community so the community can understand what it is that that is is happening i mean a lot of right. cases people don't realize you know especially in marginalized underserved communities what are what is happening to them and you know in right in right in the front of their face yeah. um so i think that we you know one of the one of the challenges for the for those of us who may beginning to get an understanding or have an or have an in-depth understanding is to try to figure out how we can we can bring that understanding to those who may not have it but who will be definitely affected by the outcomes um and i think that 
you know, I want to really, you know, thank you for coming on the show this evening and and um and representing the Wake County Housing Justice Coalition, um, and and taking this opportunity to to educate us and to to inform us as to what's going on in and not just in Raleigh, but what could happen in in our communities or is happening in our communities that's that's similar. Um, and I think that's important that we understand that. We'll definitely be keeping keeping um. A, a track of, of what's going on there and in ways that we can be supportive of, of what's what's happening in um in raleigh um re relative to to star relative to housing relative to to issues that are, are impacting marginalized communities um reparation that's yeah, and, you know so we we um we definitely hope to have you back again we will be we'll be following up to the vote on um, on tuesday so we can, you know, we can get the, we can see what strategic moves that we may be able to collaborate with you guys on, um, and actually uh, to help bring out this, the, to share this information. And I want to thank you, Coach, for your input as well as always. You know, you you're dynamic in this process, and um, you know, we we rely heavily on your perspective in terms of, of what what you see is going on. And while you know, um, you're always you're always welcome to come back and give us some um, feedback. And I just want to thank everyone who participated and those who are watching and those who will be watching for your input. Um, you do have the the link in the chat. We'll try to get that out so that, you know, people who want to who want to um, support this this move have the have the means and the ability to do so. Yeah, and I just want to make one last comment regardless so, of how things turn out next Tuesday, the the work to build the to build a, an on the ground movement comprised of the people like you and me, it is it's, it's gonna continue one way or another. So this is what will happen next Tuesday is not the end all be all. The work continues. And on that note, unless you have you have a final comment, um coach, we that we, we can so we can sign off. Oh, wow. Final comment. I think Shaw University is facing a major threat from what I've seen and heard. And I hope there's an abominable uh, array of support uh, I can see through our guest. And uh, I'm going to take a big, big look at it and be watching. And if they they shut down a university, a historically black college university, if, they, if gentrification can set one of those, almost shut it down. Mm. That's a scary thought. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Thank every thanks to everyone. And um we'll be looking forward to uh following up on this. Everyone thank have you. a good night. And um hopefully we'll we'll hear positive information coming from the future. Yeah.